Michael's with us from the UK. Uh, obviously, we're as part of the Fresh Expressions movement in the UK and works for Fresh Expressions UK, which is a joint venture um, now with Anglican, United Methodist, yeah. Uh, sorry, Methodist yeah, United yeah, Reformed. Church of Scotland. Church of Scotland. Salvation Army. The Salvation. So there's yeah. quite a few so churches quite a few yeah. in that group. Uh, and Michael's role there is as the Director of Network Development and a consultant on theology and practice. Uh, lots of books um, have come from Michael, including Church for Every Context, which is a quite a good, uh, a seminal kind of work in this area. Uh, Michael's been in Australia for about six weeks or so uh, with his beloved wife, travelling around and speaking and exploring, doing all sorts of things. And Michael, we're really glad uh, that you can be with us tonight and tomorrow. I look forward to hanging out with you. Great. Um, so I think I'm just going to hand over to you and sit down and Whoa. see what I can learn. <laughs> if that's all right. <laughs> so welcome, means. Michael. Well, thanks so much for, for the welcome. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, I see you've organized especially English welcome with the weather. So uh, it was quite a bumpy flight in, I can tell you that. But um, So I feel perfectly at home. And um, uh, uh, as you heard, uh, in, in the UK, I, I've been part of the team that was set up by the archbishops about 10 years ago, the Methodist Church, uh, to promote these new and fresh forms of, of church that are emerging in the UK. And uh, I've been with the team ever since the beginning. And my main role with the team is to think about the theology that underpins these new expressions of church, uh, and also the methodology. And uh, my particular interest is trying to bring the two together. How does theory and practice actually come together and, and, and work itself out? So um, so that's uh, a little bit about my background. And what I want us to do uh, this evening is to think about what it means to lead mission uh, beyond the boundaries of the church. Some people, of course, talk about mission as evangelism. Other people talk about it as social action. So I want us to be thinking about how you can combine the two into integrated forms of mission. And I want to do this by talking about our experience of Fresh Expressions in the UK. Uh, and I want to uh, first introduce Fresh Expressions, talk a little bit about the methodology. Some of you will be familiar with the term, some of you may be familiar a little bit with what I say. Uh, and then in the second part, I, I want us to look at how um, uh, leaders of local churches can encourage uh, these uh, types of church uh, in their local uh, contexts. So um, these are, are fresh expressions of church. They're initiatives that start with loving service, that build community, and introduce people to the gospel. And uh, if I give you an example, uh, I could speak about some women in an English village who wish to reach out to teenagers. And so uh, they gathered a few teenagers, taught them how to cook. And of course, there's no point in cooking food if you don't eat it. And so they'd eat together. And as they ate together, they shared their lives. Uh, this uh, sharing of people's lives began the teenagers on a journey towards Jesus Christ. And over a number of months, uh, uh, and over a number of years, really, a small Christian community began to form around this practice of cooking, eating, sharing lives, beginning to pray together, beginning to study scripture together. Uh, eventually, uh, the teenagers described themselves as cook at church. So um, these fresh expressions uh, that I want to say more about, they're springing up all over the place. Uh, they're multiplying at a considerable rate. Uh, the uh, uh, Church Army Research Unit has conducted some research and published this research uh, just over a year ago, they found that 13.5% of Church of England churches have a fresh expression of church. Now our best estimate is that 10 years ago that figure would have been less than 3%. So you can get the sense of the speed at which these uh, fresh expressions are emerging. Uh, in our, our, the goals that we set ourselves when we apply for money, uh, we think it, it's a no-brainer to imagine that in 10 more years we'll have at least a quarter, perhaps a third of Church of England churches with a fresh expression of church. The, um, uh, if you, the, the, the leaders of these fresh expressions, uh, they say that at their main meetings there's an average of 44 people present and that of those people, a quarter are folks who 
regularly have been to church. Uh, they're part of the core team. Just over a third of people who used to go to church had stopped going to church, but are beginning to reconnect through this fresh expression. And then something like 40%, two-fifths, of people who've got very little church background. So sometimes I say to my students in Oxford, I say, now just imagine that big church just up the road called St Andrews. And imagine that on a Sunday morning the minister comes and as the minister looks over the congregation, the minister sees that a quarter of the congregation in front of him are people who regularly come to church Sunday, Sunday by Sunday. Over a third of people who used to go to church are just returning to church now. It stopped and they're coming back. And then two-fifths of people who've hardly ever been to church before. Now, if that were the case, and that was the figures week after week, people around Oxford would be saying, this is totally phenomenal. We'd all be pouring in to see what was going on. They'd be talking about something as if it was a revival breaking out. Well, the analogy is not quite exact, but that's the sort of thing that is happening up and down the country with these fresh expressions of church. What is going on is really, I believe, quite are uh, remarkable. They are connecting these fresh expressions with by and large more people outside the church than with people inside the church. And I don't know of any missional activity that combines evangelism with social action that actually has that effect. Just before Christmas I received an email from a pioneer who is conducting research into the fresh expression that he once led. He stopped attending uh, the fresh expression was now doing research into it. He wrote, having visited the community twice in recent weeks to conduct interviews, I can tell you that there are not many atheists and agnostics attending at the moment. This is because most have come to faith. There's growing anecdotal evidence that these fresh expressions are remarkably fruitful at helping people to make a journey towards a Jesus. So what are these fresh expressions of church? Well they have four characteristics. First of all they are missional. They work well, mainly with people who are outside the church. Outside the church. Secondly they are they seek to fit the context to be appropriate to the uh, people who they're seeking to serve. Thirdly they're formational. They aim to make disciples. And then fourthly they're ecclesial. They intend to be a congregation in their own right or a church in their own right. They are not a stepping stone to an existing congregation. So let me give you an example. Saturday gathering. Uh, it arose out of a food bank, a, an ecumenical food bank in one of our northern towns. And uh, people would come Saturday morning by Saturday morning uh, to collect free food because they couldn't afford to buy their own food. These are people who are not regularly attending church. Uh, one Saturday, the, some of the leaders involved, they uh, said to the clients of the food bank, they said, we're going to be meeting on Saturday evening. We're going to eat together. There'll be good food. We're going to chat about our lives and what's going on, and we'll look at some of the stories that Jesus told and see if we agree with them. We may pray together. Uh, if you'd like to come, feel free to do so. But even if you don't come, the food bank's still going to be here next Saturday. So uh, first, um, uh, first uh, Saturday when people came, uh, there were 12 people. A year later, there were 60 people. So here you see they're missional. They're working with people who are largely outside the church. They're contextual. What they did on the Saturday evening was appropriate for those people. They wanted to be there. Um, they're formational. People keep kept, have kept coming back. And as they've kept coming back, a number of them have found faith and they've had baptisms within Saturday gathering on Saturday evenings. The folks who come started calling it our church. This is my church. So the leaders scratched their heads. They said we didn't aim to start a church. So they went back to the uh, ecumenical churches in the, in, in the town uh, and they said, uh, would you mind recognizing this as a church? Are you going to find that difficult? 
And their response, fairly obvious, they said, well, these people aren't coming to our church. If they're coming to your church, that's brilliant. Absolutely. So they're not a stepping stone to an existing church. They seek to be an expression of church where people already are. These are fresh expressions of church. Um, they're not better than existing churches. They have a different mission or focus. Many of the existing churches are brilliant at reaching people on their immediate fringes. Fresh expressions of church are brilliant at meeting, meeting people beyond the fringe of, of church and, and, and connecting with them. Both existing churches and new types of church have a place in God's kingdom. One is not better than the other. They both have a role. They have distinctive missions and ministries. And we often in the UK talk about the mixed economy church, the both and church, where both wings of the church, uh, older and newer, can affirm and support each other and be in, in, be in loving fellowship uh, with one another. How do these fresh expressions work? Well, they come to birth by means of what we call the serving first journey. Uh, they start with an explicit or implicit process of listening. Uh, a small group of Christians, very often it is a small group, might be three or four or five people, could be larger. Uh, they'll listen to the context and they will prayerfully be asking themselves, how can we love and serve the people around here? And then as they find simple ways of loving and serving people in the context, they build community with them. And as they build community with them, they then uh, uh, respond to opportunities to, to share their faith and provide opportunities for individuals to explore what it means to be a follower of Christ, to explore discipleship. Uh, as individuals come into faith, a church begins to, or something with the flavors of church, begins to form around those people. And at their best, they'll then go and do it again. So let me give you the example of thirst just outside Cambridge. Sue has been uh, dropping her children off at school for a number of years. She's got to know other parents, mainly mothers, at the school gates. In her conversations with them, she picks up, this is the listening, she picks up that they would love to hang out together and just chat. So she goes and talks to the head teacher and she says, can we use the school staff room one morning a week before break time? So after we've dropped our kids at school, can we use the staff, uh, staff room for an hour and a half before the staff come and use it at break time? So the head teacher agrees. And so as her act of loving and serving, uh, she says to the uh, mums that she knows, she says, we're going to provide some croissants some nice uh, coffee, probably not, not as nice as Australian coffee, but trying to uh, approach that. Uh, provide some nice coffee, fruit juice, and so on. Uh, why don't we just hang out together for an hour or so after we've dropped off the kids? So um, they meet, the, the mothers meet. She's not quite sure, Sue, what, what to do, you know, to get them chatting. So she shows them the, uh, a NUMA DVD. Are you familiar with NUMA DVDs? Okay, so she shows them one of these DVDs. The women love it. So week after week, they discuss a NUMA DVD. After a bit, um, you know, as they keep coming back, community forms. You know, they, they enjoy each other's company. Uh, after a while, Sue picks up that there are some of them who would love to, an opportunity to explore what it means to follow Christ in more depth. So she starts a separate Bible study group. And this group, uh, you know, the main Wednesday morning discussion continues with croissants and so on, but this group meets at a separate time and they do some simple Bible study. And they learn to pray together. And they begin to worship in a very simple way, together. And the women love it. And they come into faith and they say, this is fantastic. If only we could invite our friends. But we can't invite our friends because they're all at work. So they say, let's do Thirst 2 on Saturday afternoon. Let's do it differently. We'll make it an all-age initiative so that whole families can come, uh, families of our friends. So there you are, listening, loving and serving, uh, forming community, exploring discipleship, 
something with the flavors of church taking shape around those who come into faith, doing it again. In real life, these circles overlap. It's always much more messy than a model. Occasionally, they're taken in a different order. But what intrigues me is time and again, when you peel back the sort of uh, paper and look beneath the surface, you find that these fresh expressions are making this kind of a journey. None of us sat in our offices and dreamt up this journey and said, this is the best way of doing it. We've just noticed that this is what people do as they follow their noses, we hope following the Holy Spirit, and uh, find that something akin to church emerges around what they do. If I give you a second example, worship on Wednesday, uh, a new minister uh, arrives in, in, uh, uh, in, in the local church, in a Yorkshire village in this case, um, and gets to know people connected with the primary school. Picks up a game that they would love to hang out together. So uh, his act of loving and serving is to form an after-school club, but it's all age. So the parents, uh, they collect and carers, pick up their children from school. They come up to the church, which is very close by. When they get to church, they, uh, uh, they do some refreshments for the children and the adults. Uh, the children play for a bit, the adults talk together, and then there's a very simple act of worship. Uh, folks come back regularly. So after a few months, there's a, a core group of perhaps about 30 adults and children who are coming week after week. Uh, they put on uh, uh, one or two special events to help the adults make a journey towards Christ. Uh, as the adults make that journey, increasingly this um, uh, gathering has the flavor of church about it. In fact, they find that the adults are saying, this is our church. There's no attempt to get them to come to church on Sunday morning, because what's going on here is much more friendly, it's much more contextual, it's much more appropriate for those families. Very simple, very simple, but very fruitful in terms of people making a journey uh, into faith. Now for me, there are three uh, uh, striking features of this serving first journey. The first is that it, it brings together the great commandment to love other people with the great commission to make disciples. My own uh, background in, in, in the UK is that of an evangelical. I was brought up as an evangelical. My parents were evangelical uh, missionaries. and. Um, I have, have spent much of my life sitting at the feet of people like uh, Leslie Newbegin, the great mission, 20th century mission thinker. And the people like Newbegin used to say that um, there's absolutely no contradiction between uh, the mission of evangelism and the mission of social action. They both belong together. And I used to sit there thinking to myself, yeah, that's absolutely true, biblically. The trouble is I can't see it. I could see some churches that were brilliant at evangelism and other churches that were brilliant at social action. Sometimes I could see churches that did both. But when I look closely, some Christians in those churches were doing evangelism and other Christians were doing social action. I never saw the two combined until I saw Fresh Expressions. And with fresh expressions, social action and evangelism come together in the form of that journey that I've just described. There's loving and serving, first of all, building community, and then there's the evangelism uh, that follows that. I think it's very interesting. The great commandment comes before the great commission. And so often I have to keep telling my evangelical friends, you know, in the 21st century, maybe it worked in the past, but it doesn't work going straight to evangelism. You have to love and serve people. And I have to tell some of my more liberal friends, you know, it's great doing all the loving and serving, but honestly, if you believe that Jesus is of any value at all, then you would want to introduce people to him at some stage. Why not combine both? Here they are in Fresh Expressions. Both loving and serving, and evangelism brought together 
in a holistic, integrated form of local mission. Building on this, a second feature of this journey, which I think is very interesting, is that it, it combines different theological persuasions. When I speak to uh, some of our experts in England on liberation theology, uh, I was sitting down talking with one of them, and uh, I, I talked him through, I said, if you want to know how fresh expressions work, this is how they work, and I described the journey to him. He said, Mike, I just love that. Because, you see, he said it starts with listening. We in liberation theology in South America and elsewhere, we talk about praxis. Things start with practice. You know, our reflection is on what is happening on the ground. Everything starts with practice. Listening is, is absolutely at the heart of practice. So people who are into liberation theology can see themselves in this journey. People who love social action can see themselves in this journey. People who are into community and the Christian community from the more Catholic end of the spectrum, they can see themselves in this journey. And so can evangelicals who are into evangelism and making disciples. Different wings of the church can see themselves in this journey. And I often say to people, you know, there's, you know, in a denomination or in a diocese, often there are many different missional agendas. And people are saying, ah, oh, we're into the women's issue. And I want to say to them, yes. And if you're concerned about uh, women from women's refuges, then, you know, why not form a community of women who've been badly treated and let them walk, support each other and walk a journey into faith. And then other people have missional agendas that are all about social action. And I was talking to someone in Wollongong and they were talking about getting together a group of people who are committed to climate change and saying, why don't we share our, um, our experiences of this? Why don't we act together uh, to campaign for climate change? But at the same time, why don't we explore spiritual resources that can support what we're doing so that we can tie spirituality and climate change together? And he was uh, talking about how he'd do that from a, a Christian perspective. Other people say, you know, well, you know, the real priority for me is, is people with disabilities. Well, I'm thinking of a number of our fresh expressions that have started among people with disabilities. I'm thinking of, a, a, of, of some teachers who are teaching people with learning needs. And uh, they started a fresh expression on a Saturday morning for people with learning difficulties. You see, almost every missional agenda that you have can be supported by fresh expressions of church. This doesn't mean that fresh expressions sort of colonize these agendas and take them over and say, gosh, you know, they're all us, fresh expressions now. Not like that at all. But much more, fresh expressions can add another dimension to a, a missional agenda. I believe these fresh expressions are an ecumenical gift because so many different parts of the church can see themselves in that journey that I described. And then thirdly, the journey itself works through a dynamic of gift and response. What propels the journey is the offer of a gift at each stage and the response. So for example, listening is a gift. To listen to people is, is perhaps one of the most wonderful gifts you can give anyone. When people respond to that listening with ideas for loving and serving, with enthusiasm and willingness to help, then you can offer the second gift, which is the gift of loving and serving. And when people respond to that gift of loving and serving by coming back regularly, then of course you can offer a third gift, which is the gift of community, because community forms as people get to know each other and come back. And as community forms, then um, maybe uh, uh, it elicits the response of gratitude, and trust, and uh, enjoyment, and things like that, which become doorways into exploring Jesus. And so a response of building trust and of appreciation and so on provides opportunities for the next gift, the gift of offering people the gospel. 
And as people respond to that gift, then you can offer the further gift, which is the gift of something with the flavor of church taking shape around those who come to faith. And then as I uh, illustrated with that example of thirst, as people come into faith and enjoy being church and get enthusiastic about it, then they may well, well offer the next gift, which is the gift of doing the same thing again, but perhaps in a different way for people who they haven't connected with. The dynamic of this journey is gift and response. It's a journey of grace, if you like. And I want to just uh, end, uh, if I may, this little uh, part of the session, and then we're going to have time for questions and comment, um, by, by talking about the theology of gift which lies behind uh, fresh expressions of church. Because when we encounter God in mission, we encounter a generous God. A God who showers the world with gifts. And one of the gifts that God gives to the world is the church. The church, it's not a gift to us believers. The church is a gift to the world. And the church can be a gift to the world in, in many different ways. Uh, the church can share its resources with other organizations. It can provide pastoral care. It can join uh, struggles for justice and uh, for climate, uh, for environmental improvement and so on. There, there are many ways that the church can be a gift to the world. And in these ways that I've just described, well, the church is doing something wonderful, but it's not very different to any other organization. There is, however, one gift that the church can offer that no other organization can offer a gift that is unique to the church. And that is the gift of being in community with Jesus. The gift of communal life with Jesus is a gift that only the church can offer. Now when you uh, offer a gift, generosity demands that you offer the gift in a form that is appropriate to the other person. If a friend of mine is a teetotaler, it wouldn't be a very good gift for me to give him a bottle of wine. The gift has to be appropriate to the other person. And in the same way, generosity requires that the church offers the gift of communal life with Jesus in a form that is appropriate to those who might receive it. For some, that will be an invitation to an existing congregation. But for others, such an invitation will be inappropriate. The congregation may meet in a place, at a time, and in a style that is inaccessible to certain people. And in such cases, the offer of communal life with Jesus will take the form of a new congregation. A congregation that meets in a place, at a time, and in a style that is accessible to its potential recipients. Now once the gift has been offered, again, generosity demands that there be a letting go. The giver must allow the recipient to receive the gift in her or his own way. For example, if I give a toy aeroplane to my grandson and then I hold his hand the whole afternoon showing him exactly how to play with that toy aeroplane, really it ceases to be a gift to him and becomes a gift to me in effect so that I can relive my childhood. I have to let the gift go. And in a similar way, when we offer the gift of communal life with Jesus, we must be prepared for the recipients to receive the gift in their own way. We must let the gift go. Now, of course, we'll pass on scripture, and we'll have done some teaching about how they might read scripture. 
We'll pray that they've received the Holy Spirit. We'll provide all sorts of appropriate support. But ultimately, we must let the gift go. We must allow the recipients of the gift of communal life with Jesus to contextualize that gift in their own way through the Spirit in a way that seems most appropriate to them. When a congregation passes on the gift of communal life with Jesus in this way, instead of the gift dying as the congregation dwindles, the gift gets handed down the generations and gets transmitted into new contexts. It becomes a living gift, a living gift for anyone who wants to receive it. And I'd suggest that in our thinking about fresh expressions, as we talk about leadership at the front here, we're talking about sharing a gift with people who haven't received this gift before. And to think of it in those terms, I think, is a helpful way, because it takes us straight back to the heart of our faith, which is the grace of God and the gifts that he's already shared with us. So what I suggest we do is that just in twos and threes, I'd encourage you to buzz together for five minutes. What have you found uh, exciting in what I've said, perhaps? What have you found challenging? Uh, what would you like to know more about? And then we'll have some time for questions and comment. So if you'd like to just do that for five minutes in, in your different twos and threes. What's been exciting? What have you found challenging? What do you want to know more about? And then when we do plenary, I've turned off. Great, thanks. I'm <laughs> 
Shall we uh, come back together uh, as a single group? Okay, so this is a chance for people to make uh, comments, ask questions, or share their reactions to what I've said so far. So who would like to start? Uh, yeah, please do. Everybody's being a bit reluctant to say something that's from their field. Uh, if we want to get, well, it's happening, it has happened, but uh, it's very easy to get 100 or 200 people if you run uh, a function which has the, uh, the Christians, Jews, and Islam people. And the shock to me was how much people of Islam, the genuine people of Islam, uh, are reaching out to us, not as Christians, but as fellow uh, worshippers of God. And yet, uh, and, and we have, unfortunately, a test of university here, uh, a sector which looks after that. Uh, uh, we don't hear, I've done the new, the new uh, church England, leading people into growth and, and this, but there's no mention of truly God, truly God's word, for God's work, we've got to do something with our fellow uh, believers in God, with Islam and Jews. We we just we seem to be ignoring that. I think the um, I think the answer is like all things, fresh expressions is not all forms of mission. 
So um, there is work to be done of um, a multi-faith nature where we collaborate with other faiths on agendas which we share, uh, and there are lots of those as, as part of our common humanity. So, and that's fine. And Fresh Expressions is not occupying that space. So Fresh Expressions is not occupying the space of what can we do with Muslims to advance the common good. We're not, we're not in that space. It's great space for someone to occupy. Absolutely fantastic space. But that's not our space. So the space that Fresh Expressions are, are occupying is a space of saying, how can we love and serve people? And if in the process of doing that and building community with them, they want to hear about the gospel, uh, how, how would we share that with them? And that's a subtly different space. And, um, and that's a great space too. So this is, would be my reaction is let's enjoy each other's spaces and respect them and not muddle them up. Because if you muddle them up, you do get problems as you'll appreciate. Thank you. Um, yeah, yeah, please. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, what, in, in order to prepare a church to look at fresh expressions, like the first um, example, a uh, fantastic example, and I can see how it could happen, but one of the things that I find people who want to engage in this don't know where to start. So what were some of the preparation steps to get yeah. them to that point of, of the, the mum that went to school? Because yeah. we've all been standing at the school gate and say, yeah, let's go for coffee. But what's the preparation that gets yeah. you in your head? Okay, so we will talk a little bit more about that in the second half. Okay. But, but, but let me start because it's really important this. Um, and I've been, I, I'm in, I didn't say in the introduction, I'm an ordained Anglican minister, so I've led a church, so I, I know all the temptations and the you know, hopes of that. But um, I, I think that if, I'm a, if I was a local church leader, um, the best way to start fresh, encourage fresh expressions is to work with the basic ethos of fresh expressions. And it, fresh expressions of church have been bottom up. So the temptation you see of a minister is to say, let's come in and let's do a program of teaching and get the whole church faith-kissed in this direction. I wouldn't do that, personally. I think to lead our local church into wholesale change requires huge qualities of leadership that are way beyond most local clergy. Let me tell you, way beyond me anyway, all right? And I don't think that top-down approach is, is very effective for most ordinary clergy. So for most of us who are fairly ordinary, I would go in at a, at a bottom-up level, and I'll be looking for the one or two people in the congregation who might get this. And I would then be talking to them in the way that I'm going to model in the second half. Um, you know, take me into your world, let's see how we can make this work. So I'd be effectively coaching them one-to-one. -one. And as I do that, I'll be telling my leadership team, I'll be saying, um, whoever they are, I'll be saying, as part of my pastoral ministry as a pastor here, I'm working with X and X to help them um, see how they can be more effective in their Christian life during the week by teaming up with one or two other Christians and seeing if there are ways that they can serve people around about them. Uh, probably for most people in the leadership team, that was a whoosh above their head, but they'll have enough information that they, it's all they need at that stage. Later on, as this thing begins to make a journey, I'll be sharing some of that. So I might say, you remember I was saying that with Betty we're doing this, well she's actually got a group together and they're doing that. Um, and then at an appropriate time, I would have Betty at the front of church and interview her, get her to tell the story, when there's a story to be told because there may not be a story coming out of this, but when there is. And at that time, people then start asking questions. And the sort of questions they'll be saying is the leadership team will be saying, hey, what about the oversight of this? And you'll be saying, well, you'll be saying, at the moment, I'm exercising that oversight. But we need to talk to Betty to see whether for Betty, this is something she's doing in her private time that's got nothing to do with the church, or whether she sees this as part of us. And then if she sees this as part of us, we need to talk about how she makes reports to the church council. Members of the congregation will be saying, when are these folks going to worship with us and join us? Okay? 
So then you say to them, let's have a discussion with Betty about that. And Betty might say, actually, why don't we get two or three of my folks to come, let them experience worship here, and then let them talk back to the church leadership or the congregation about how they've experienced it. And so what you do is, instead of fighting all these battles in advance, in a theoretical way, which is when conflict is most likely to occur, what you do is you address them in a relational way with the people involved. That doesn't mean there won't be differences of view, but my experience is that most people are quite nice. And when they see another human being in front of them, their hearts begin to melt. And so difficult things, theoretically, become easier, but not always easy, but become easier on the ground when you're dealing with real people. So I would do it incrementally like that, bottom them up, and I'll talk about some of, more of that in a moment. And I think this is nothing in, you know, nothing in life is perfect. There's no stress-free route here for anything. But I think you'll find that that's an easier approach than trying to go and preach about it top down, etc., etc. Okay, yeah. Uh, this is sort of all on there. I mean, how have how has the institution of the church some and, and you come from the church and United churches of similarity to that? We've got a very big, sometimes very clumsy structure. Uh, how has the fresh expressions been? accommodated nearly in, in that space and, and what's the pushback from the institution? Uh, I, I speak up on your point about that fact that this Betty's group that's called it is the church now. You know, yeah. how, how does the institution in your experience yeah. cope with that? Yeah. And and what have they how have they been able to to have been able to kind of overcome some of the tensions there? Well the 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 thing that really made a difference to us in the Church of England and the Methodist churches was the report that came out, Mission Shaped Church Report in 2004. And, and it wasn't the report itself, it was a pretty average report. But it was the fact that Archbishop Royal Williams put his name to it and said that this is one of my top priorities as the new Archbishop of Canterbury. And um, that gave, the, gave it a symbolic movement that was very important. So I've been saying to some of the denominational leaders that I've met with who said we're reaching, reaching a bit of a roadblock here. We don't feel we're making a move forward. I'm saying to them, actually, it would help you to find a symbol of the institution's support. It's probably not a report, but some symbol that will show the uh, members of the congregation that the institution believes in this. So there was permission giving, which was very important in the early days. Um, and then I think the, the rule of thumb has been that um, uh, I've seen us take two initiatives. One was in response to a clear problem, all right, and this was a problem of church planting across parish boundaries, which was an issue for us. And um, we addressed that with some legislative change. And then there was another issue that we addressed, but it was in advance of the need being understood. And we thought in advance that there was going to be a problem about getting entrepreneurial clergy. So we said let's create a special track called ordained pioneer ministers. Actually we did that too early in my view because the uh, evidence shows first of all that nearly half these fresh expressions are being led by lay people and secondly of the overwhelming majority of clergy led fresh expressions are led by clergy far in excess in number of the ordained pioneer ministers. So the system wasn't preventing entrepreneurial clergy coming through. So we spent an inordinate amount of institutional time and energy putting into place ways of selecting and training and deploying these ordained pioneer ministers when we needn't have bothered. And if we'd waited, I think we would have we, I think we'd have appointed them now, but we'd have given them a different brief. We're to say we need clergy who will be connectors between these new types of fresh expressions and the existing church. And that's a different sort of brief. And we would have approached it differently. So my advice to an institution is um, actually um, just respond to the problems as they arise. Don't try and anticipate the problems. Respond as they arise. 
um, and, um, and use the learning of the nature of the problem to condition your response. But my overall comment is, in this betwixt and between time, as we travel this journey, it is full of tension and mess. And we, there's no way of avoiding that. And so I say to pioneers and champions of fresh expressions, the best thing you can do is to love the institution. Because you're not going to get anywhere with a battle. It, you're not, you know, we know you're going to be frustrated, that's part of it. You have to bear the pain, like Jesus bore the pain. And the best thing to do is to simply love and love and love again. Because that's going to keep that open more doors than getting ready cross. Mm -hmm. um, that's easy to say and very hard to do. <laughs> so, but the, anyway, I get who I've given enough yeah, flavors yeah, enough. Yeah. yeah. Margaret, I don't know if I'm following up with Andrew. I'll yeah. say that I am because I won't make it up on Yeah, blame um, it. Yeah. In terms of your experience in the UK yeah. and, and the fact that with the Church of England, Methodist, the URC, and the, and so are you know, churches yeah. following, are all churches that have within their polity the regional structures of the diocese and districts yeah. and so on? Yeah. Do you have a sense that that has been one of the things which has been a, a positive or, or a negative in terms of the support and encouragement of the development of fresh expressions across those churches? Um, I'm not sure whether it's been a negative or a plus, but I can say that the different regional structures have shown different degrees of enthusiasm. So, um, you know, with, within the Church of England, there's, there are a handful of dioceses that are really going for it. And Leicester Diocese, for example, you know, they, they, they had virtually they had about six fresh expressions in 2006. They took a decision in 2010. They now have 60 fresh expressions uh, to, to be actively supporting it. They now have 60 fresh expressions, um, including some on the way to being a fresh expression. Because they've developed a track record, they now have applied and got money to appoint additional staff. They don't think it's unrealistic to think of something like 150 fresh expressions in 10 years time. So they are really steaming along. And, and, the, and the thing that makes a difference is to appoint a member of staff, whether it's a synod member, a presbytery member, a, a, a diocese or whatever the, the, the structure is, a member of staff who will be a networker. And he'll go along and get alongside people who are doing fresh expressions, encourage them, help coach them, uh, uh, winkle out people who might be interested in doing, starting fresh expressions but haven't got the support, give them the support, help them make the journey. Uh, I came across one, one such person in Sydney with the Uniting Church. Uh, I can't remember his mind, but he walked into the room. I was, you know, it was a seminar room, there's a special group of people there. And as he walked in, within three seconds, I could see he got it. You know, he was a uh, sort of person you love, he, he lifted people's morale, uh, there's a certain personal charisma to him, he was massively affirming of each person in the room. Now you need someone like that to be encouraging people on the ground. If you as an institution or a regional part of the institution want to be proactive, if you feel you can't afford that and you're not ready for that, then simply giving permission will help some stuff to emerge. But if you want to accelerate it, you need that sort of thing. That hasn't totally answered your question, but it is saying that some regions are going for this and others aren't. Okay, yeah. one more, up. Okay, one more and then one more. Yeah. With Leicester, though, for example, being a diocese and being a region, yeah. actually acted with it's been an interest. Yeah. And it is actually it, it was, so the so I mean I think um, uh, the, the advantage of a regional structure is that it does give permission for some regions to do it and others not. I mean that's obviously the, the case. But I think you probably you you know uh, in Australia that you know I've met people who are talking about having some national you know network and there has been a national network. And personally, I don't see it. You know I think I think it's it's you've got to be close to people on the ground. You know so it's 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 encouraging potential leaders of fresh expressions on the ground. You've got to get close. And that again is being it's with the with the, with the basic drive of fresh expressions, which is bottom up. So if you want to encourage them, you have to encourage them bottom up. So that means you've got to be alongside people. Yeah. yeah. It strikes me that every parish I've been involved in, it's a few now, 
lay people have always come to me with lots of ministry ideas. But people have always been very, it always started like a craft group or yeah, yeah. whatever it is. But we've always been lousy in doing the next thing. Yep. You know, doing the music or the prayer mm. or the, I've come to learn about uh, Christ, you know. Mm. And you might suggest to your craft group, oh, let's have some songs. And they say, no, no, let's just keep it as a, a craft group. Well, let's keep the sailing thing, let's start the sailing group. Oh, that's just, you know, hard to make that next step. It is hard to make that next step. It strikes me that maybe one person doesn't have to do everything. Maybe some people are good at starting the group and other people need to be the ones to make an invitation or, oh. or to help them from yeah. now on to do it. Um, you're absolutely right. It, it is quite hard to make the next step. And we're going to talk about that tomorrow night, and I know you can't be there, so I'm sorry about that. But that, we are going to talk about making that next step tomorrow evening. So I'm not going to say it now. Uh, I think, uh, and we will talk about it in a minute, about having teams of people. I think that's really important. My impression, and I, don't, I, I know Australia is very different, and it, it may not work here, but in the UK, for the 40s age group downwards, to start something with explicitly spirituality in it is not impossible. So if I was in Oxford, you know, if I, well, I live in Oxford, you know, book clubs are two a dozen in Oxford, but if I was doing it and wanting to do this with a church hat on, I might say, let's start a book club with a difference. We're going to look at books that we read from an ethical and spiritual dimension. So it might be a book club with spirituality. Uh, and then if I was doing it, I would, um, because I'd convene the group, uh, I'd, I'd, I'd chair the first session, and I'd say, you know, because we're a book club with a difference, and we want to bring some spirituality into this, I'm going to suggest that at the end of each of our sessions, we have some headspace. And um, you can use the session, we'll have five minutes of quietness. Uh, anyone who believes in God, you know, you can pray to God, him, her, it, whatever your conception is. If you don't believe in God, you can have positive thoughts, you know, for the people next to you. But we'll have five minutes of headspace. And if I was leading it, I would then pray like mad. And I would say, Father, you know, um, I've done my bit, you do yours. You know, send the Holy Spirit, please, and may the Holy Spirit be at work. And uh, quietly, I'd watch for how, how things happened. And I would expect, because this is my experience, that after a few weeks, people would start beginning to shine and say, it's amazing, you know, that time in headspace I thought this, or I prayed for this, and that happened. And then, because most people don't have a Christian language or a spiritual language, I would then start, so I would say something like, you know, from my view as a point of view as a, as a Christian, I think what happened was this. I think the Holy Spirit was at work in your life. And I start to name it. Um, but always naming it as my language, not theirs. So just they don't have to own that language if they don't want to. Uh, and then I'll you know, see how that builds, go step by step. So in other words, what I'm saying is part of the answer to how do you go the next step is maybe to include something to do with spirituality at the early stages. I'm not saying all groups can start like that. I'm not saying they all have. And lots of examples I've got didn't start like that. Again, I'll, you know, but tomorrow I'll give some more examples of how people have made that journey. One more question and then oh, we will But Part of that isn't in, in that initiating of the group. There's that dual intent of creating community yep. and introducing people to God. To God, rather than just saying we need a craft group, yep. we need a sailing group. So yep. there is actually an intentionality yep. around yep. the commencement of the group. Um, and we know with messy church that that can work. You know, you know, even in Australia, where people keep, keep telling me we're so, you know, unreligious here in Australia. But even in Australia, Messy Church has worked. So let's, um, that's great. So thank you for that. Let's let's um, let's have a comfort break. Five minutes, okay? Okay. So um, fantastic. Um, I'll do another short little burst now, and then again we can have a time for um, questions and and and, re and response and so on. So um, what I really want to say um, uh, in this session, which builds on the answer I gave earlier, is that we're finding in the UK 
that um, uh, fresh expressions are for ordinary people um, and that um, they're being led by ordinary people <coughs> in their everyday lives. I mean, I'm thinking of someone like uh, Louisa, for example. And Louisa worked in a general medical practice. She was uh, what you would call a community nurse. And uh, she discovered that uh, in the practice, the uh, uh, young mothers suffered from uh, an abnormally high incidence of postnatal depression. And so she went and talked to some uh, a couple who lived on the housing estate where many of these young mums came from. And they came up with the idea of um, starting a support group for these young mothers. Uh, and so they would meet in, in the, the, this couple's home and uh, Louisa would be there as the community nurse. Um, as these young mums met, they picked up that they would love to spend more time together, uh, perhaps without their children. And so they gave them a menu of things that the mums might want to do. Uh, one of the items on the menu was to watch and discuss a video in which people described how their lives had been changed by God. Uh, and so they started discussing that. And to cut a long story short, uh, after a period of time, something that's very much akin to a church uh, emerged around this initiative. Um, as it happened last year, I was speaking at a conference and I used this particular example and someone came up to me afterwards and said, Mike, um, I was one of the original parents in that group. So um, if you'd said to Louisa, go and plant a church, she would have died. <laughs> you know, if you'd said, join your church planting team, she said, that's not my thing. But you see, asking her to do something that added value to part of her everyday life. This made sense. Uh, and I, I've been around, I've talked to other, many of our fresh expressions, many of the best ones are actually led by women. You know, and I'm thinking of two women, I, I, you know, who, who I went and interviewed and they were, you know, they just loved um, doing sort of cooking and that sort of thing. Uh, and they started a cafe, again with it attached to a medical practice. Uh, the general practitioners in, in UK, uh, this, this practice had discovered that uh, if you have a support group for patients, they come and visit the doctor less often. So in terms of our NHS, where you're paid for by the number of patients rather than the number of visits, this is fantastic. So um, they started this support group with the local church, and these two people run it. And when I interviewed them, they were you know, beginning to pray for people, and they got ideas for how they could walk a journey uh, towards being church. But um, the important thing about this is that these folks are doing it as, as part of what interests them, as part of their ordinary lives. And more and more fresh expressions are lay led. And so this means, if we're talking about what does it mean to, mean to lead at the frontier, it, this means that church leaders can have a new role, which is to be catalysts and supporters of lay people who want to take these initiatives. Uh, I often say to people, to clergy particularly, you do not need to be very entrepreneurial yourself. You do not need to be a great risk taker. You do not need to be a great initiator. Many of you who are clergy, I say, uh, feel that you're called to the pastoral ministry. Well, this is about exercising your pastoral gifts in a new way. What leaders of fresh expressions need are good pastors. They need people who, whose shoulders they can cry on, folks who can ask them intelligent questions, who can support them and encourage them. Um, and so uh, what I want to suggest to you is, is a way that pastors uh, could be encouraging their people, uh, members of the congregation who want to start a fresh expression of church. Pastors do not need to do this. Ministers do not need to start fresh expressions themselves. Uh, in fact, it's probably better if they don't and if they can get lay people to do this as part of their everyday lives. So um, uh, what, what I've given you, by the way, is, is uh, I've distributed um, one of these leaflets, and if you haven't got one, come and see me. Uh, on one side, it just advertises the, the book I've recently written, uh, Being Church, Doing Life, which is a, a sort of um, 
uh, an introduction for ordinary people into how to start fresh expressions of church. First few chapters have got a lot more on the theology than we've had time to deal with today. Um, uh, they're very practical. There are 120 stories, and the stories are printed in italics, uh, so that you don't need to read the rest of the book. You can just read the stories, uh, and um, you know you can do it in, in half an evening. Um, on this side, uh, we've just published what we've called uh, Essential to Fresh Expressions, and that's seven guides to fresh expressions. Each guide can be read in three minutes. So you probably can't absorb it in three minutes, but you can read it in three minutes. So seven three-minute guides. Um, so actually all you need is 21 minutes and you've got it. Okay? Um, and some of uh, how to start a fresh expression uh, is some of the material I'm going to go through and use now. But there's lots of other material here, how to start making disciples, how to grow mature disciples and so on. So um, if we, uh, these obviously downloads, you can use them yourselves. If you are representatives of a diocese or a denomination, you can download these and you can rebrand them. You can rewrite them in Australian. You can use Australian examples and you can just have them. You know, do whatever you want with them. If you want to put at the bottom that they came originally from Fresh Expressions UK, that's fine. If you forget, we're not going to take you to court. So um, uh, they're there, you know, um, you know, just as it were, from a distillation of our experience, if you like. So if you were a, a, a pastor, a minister, overseeing uh, a, a layperson who's thinking about uh, starting a fresh expression of church, you might use the following as a mental checklist of questions that you could ask. Um, so you might say to someone, um, just take me into your life. Uh, is there another Christian anywhere in any part of your life that you could do something with? So the first uh, steps towards starting a fresh expression is to ask another Christian. Uh, as a general rule, never do it alone. You know, God said it's not good for the man to be alone. God wanted the uh, original creation mandate to be carried out in teams. And we're to do this missional mandate, if you like, in teams wherever we can. Teams obviously make sense, you know, widens your networks, you know, you've got complementary skills and gifts, you support each other uh, and so on. Someone referred to teams earlier on in, in their questions. So uh, I'll ask a, a second question. Uh, secondly, uh, begin with what you've got, who you are, what you know, who you know. So Louisa, she starts with what she's got. Who is she a community nurse? What does she know? that women in the practice, young mums, have abnormally high postnatal depression. Um, who does she know? Someone on a housing estate where she talks to, has a conversation about this, and an idea emerges. Sarah's, Sarah Svathi is a, uh, a scholar in the United States, an expert on entrepreneurs, and she's done some brilliant work among entrepreneurs. And what she finds is that entrepreneurs always start with what they've got. You know, they, seldom do they just sort of have a blank piece of paper and dream up some idea in, in, a, in, a, in a field of life that they've got no experience of. Nearly always their entrepreneurial ideas comes out of their everyday experience. So, um, uh, you know, you're, you're sitting down with people and if you've got someone who's interested in starting a fresh expression, um, you've, you've said, is there another Christian they can do this with? If they come back and say yes, you might say, okay, why don't I meet with both of you? So you do this as a team. Uh, and then you might, uh, in the team, start brainstorming, you know, what have we got? What are we into? Do you love doing photography? You know, could something work around photography uh, or whatever? You know, we've, we've got fresh expressions uh, emerging among the most unexpected groups of people. Down on our south coast, we've got a, people, a group of people who love making felt, and a church is emerging among a group of felt makers. So, um, you know, when I, was in, when I was in Washington, D.C., I had 20 minutes in front of a large church to talk about this. I gave them some examples. First question, Mike, is it possible to start a fresh expression of church among flower arrangers? It would never have crossed my mind, but she got it. So wherever you've got groups of people, uh, wherever you've got passion, you know, begin with what you've got. And then chat to other people and listen. Share your ideas, chat about them, and, and see how other people respond. In a way, this is common sense. 
But um, so often people come to me and say, I don't know how to start. Well, the way you start is begin with what you've got and then chat to other people about what you've got and the ideas are emerging. And, and, and time again, Sarah Sarasvati says this very clearly, you know, for entrepreneurs, ideas emerge in conversations with partners. Entrepreneurs form partnerships and the main partnership is with their potential clients. And as a, you know, so an entrepreneur might come along, you know, I might go along to a friend. I've made a yellow shirt with red spots. And I say to my friend, would you buy it? And uh, the friend might say, she might say, well, yeah, but the red spots, you know, you, why don't you make them stars? So I make them into stars. And then I say to her, do you know any other one? Other people who might buy this. And I go and talk to some other people. Uh, and eventually I take all their comments on board and it's a red shirt or with no yellow or something. You know, so it changes. It keeps changing. And this is the point, your idea, very rarely are people who start fresh expressions, uh, do they end up with the idea exactly as they started? Much more often is their idea evolves as they talk to people. So chat to other people and expect that through those conversations the Holy Spirit will guide you to start thinking uh, perhaps differently, uh, you'll, you'll revise your ideas, and um, of course the, the, the people you've talked to, if they have a share in the final idea, they'll be committed to helping you perhaps and bring it about. So chat to others and listen. In the church where I worship, uh, I've failed completely over the last 10 years to persuade them to start fresh expressions of church. We keep having false starts and nothing happens. Uh, but one day I saw on the notice sheet that uh, they were going to start a fresh expression, uh, a, a messy church. And I said to my wife, Liz, this will not work. They haven't talked to anyone about this. This is going to be a complete waste of their time. So sure enough, the first messy church, who turns up? Four church families. The second, four church families, because these are loyal church families. But no, no one from the local school. You know, after a bit, they give up. I said to Liz, I told you they give up. You know, they haven't, they, they think, people think they're shortcuts. People think, oh, I've got the idea, we can get that. No, there are no shortcuts. You have to actually talk to the people you're wanting to serve. And you have to allow them to shape it. And it may well be the way they shape it is differently. Just imagine we start with a messy church idea. And we talk to some of the parents. And they say, we think this is a great idea. But the parents say, why are you going to provide the food? Why don't we all do it on a bring and share? Why don't we start to begin with, and we'll provide the food for a couple of sessions. But then why don't we do bring and share? Because that makes it much easier for everyone. It's less of a workload. Already the idea is being changed by the people you're seeking to serve. Isn't this common sense? So when I see identical messy churches springing up around the country, I say to myself, have they really talked to the people involved? Because they might have got something that has deeper roots and more potential for momentum if they'd really listened. I'm very struck by the number of messy churches that meet only once a month because the Christians involved say, we haven't got time to do any more. Well, of course they haven't got time because they're doing it all. You know, and the, and the people who... They're being, who are being served by Messy Church, they're helping with the washing up and perhaps one or two do helping with the crafts, but they're not really intimately involved in the leadership. Let me give you a different example, which I'll probably use tomorrow. I forget his name, Martin, I think it was. Fed up with the fact that people under 40 aren't coming to his church. So he starts a supper, 11 Alive. And um, he... Uh, uh, they meet on a Sunday morning, it's cafe style, it's short act of worship. Once every eight weeks, they eat together and they form four teams. And uh, each of these teams is led by a Christian on the core group, and then anyone in the community can join those teams. So you have atheists and agnostics joining those teams. And those teams plan two acts of worship. So two acts of worship, four teams, you've got your eight acts of worship planned. This is really easy, all right? And sometimes these atheists and agnostics, they lead the worship, all right? So we'll talk more about that tomorrow. But the point is, and his point is, it accelerates the journey to faith like nothing else. Involvement is the key to a rapid journey to faith. 
So I just offer that. I say I know there are quite a few messy churches around. You know, if you're doing a messy church, for goodness sake, indigenize the leadership. And when the parents say, we haven't got time to do this, you simply ask the question, what would you do given the time you've got? And then let the thing be reshaped according to who they are, what they know, and who they know. You know, I mean, when I say this, you're all nodding your heads because you know it's common sense. I think to myself, if this is so obvious, why aren't they doing it in Messy Church and others? So Messy Church is great, by the way. It's got so much potential. And I'm using Messy Church as an example because if Messy Church realized its potential all around Australia and in Europe and elsewhere, it would be explosive for the gospel. So begin with what you've got, chat to other people and listen. Um, dream up lots of ideas. Um, Nigel Cross in his book Design Thinking uh, summarizes some of the research into people like engineers and architects and how they go about designing things. And I bought the book because one of my students was talking to me, he wanted to write an assignment on design. And I said to him, I know nothing about design, but that hasn't stopped me before. Um, so, um, you know, what do I need to read? And as he was talking to me about the books I needed to read about design, suddenly ping went on in my head. And I thought, oh, that's what the leaders of Fresh Expressions do. They design Fresh Expressions. So why don't I read these books and see what we can learn? So the way that design architects and engineers and so on, the way they go about their, about their um, business, if you like, um, is they tackle problems through potential solutions. So uh, imagine I'm, you know, I'm the senior management of Ford Motor Company, and I go along to the design team, and I say, uh, I really want you, our marketing people, saying that we must have a faster car. So the design team starts asking, what if? What if we made a more powerful engine? Nah, too much fuel consumption. What if we improve the aerodynamics? Now, we've been doing that for the last 30 years. Not much more we can do on that front. One of the design team says, but what about, what if we use some of this new metal alloy that's being uh, uh, developed in the universities? So much lighter. So, uh-huh. So then the design team goes back to the senior managers and says, really, what we need to do is to design a lighter car. That's our design task. So you, what you do is you dream up lots of ideas by asking what if. That's what these designers do. They keep asking what if. And the experience, Nigel Cross says that the experienced designers, they um, don't foreclose that what if process too quickly. They keep asking what if. They keep the options open a little bit longer because it might just be at the very end that they come up with the perfect idea. So you keep asking, what if? What if we did this? So uh, I met with a group in my local church, and they were thinking about uh, starting a fresh expression. And I said, you know, use every prompt in your everyday life to ask what if. You know, you're thinking of doing something with teenagers. You get up in the morning. You catch a bus to work. Oh, bus, bus. What if we had a bus and kitted it out with videos and so on? Nah, probably not. You, you walk up into your um, uh, office, uh, what if work, work, work experience? What if we did some work experience for these teenagers? Nah, they're doing it all in the schools. Uh, you go out for lunch and you go into a cafe. Cafe, cafe, what if, what if we do something with a cafe for teenagers? In other words, all the time you become obsessional using all the prompts in your everyday life, the television programs, you watch everything, to dream up what if ideas. And if I was a, a sort of pastoral minister uh, talking with this team of two people, I'd be saying, go away for a few weeks, dream up as many what-if ideas as you can, and then come back with the best three. What you think are the best three. It doesn't matter if they're useless. Come back with what you think are the best three. And so they might come back with six what-if ideas, and then you use those to brainstorm more what-ifs. And you go on till you start saying, wow. What if, what if, wow, that's an interesting idea. And then you say, well, will it work? So what if, what wows, what works? What if, what wows, what works? And, um, and it's that dreaming up of different ideas and brainstorming different ideas that enables you to start putting together what you've already got 
you know, who you know, what you know, who you are, with what you're listening from the people you're chatting to, with something that's then going to be a concrete possibility. Okay, so dream up lots of ideas. Um, e is for experiment. Keep experimenting. So um, experimentation is the method, the basic method of fresh expressions. Experimentation is the basic method of fresh expressions. The reason for that is that you're moving into areas of uncertainty. You know, will you know how can we do something with the parents? Uh, at the school gate. You don't know whether this is going to work. Let's let's gather together and chat together watching a NUMA DVD. You, Sue's no idea whether that's going to work or not. The, if, you're into, if you're trying things, developing things in situations of uncertainty, experimentation is the only thing you can do. You, you can't do anything else except, is this going to work? The only way you can find out is to experiment. So experimentation is the basic methodology of first expressions. Uh, if I phrase that differently, <coughs> trial and error is the basic methodology of fresh expressions. And it's trial and error. And very often in our minds, and especially in the institution's mind, it's trial and, and then we get very quiet about the error. But actually, error is built into experimentation. But we can talk about it a bit more positively, you know, that people say, you know, there's no such thing as failure, there's only feedback. So what you're doing is you're trying experiments to get feedback. Will this work? Who turned up? And it may be that no one turns up to something that you've tried except two people. And one of those people is your key door opener who opens the doors to other people. So um, just, uh, you know, keep trying an experiment, you know, dream up ideas, go a while, and then, what? Well, okay, let's see if it works. Um, so, you know, from, from my lot, if I'd been uh, consulted about trying to do something in the schools, in our local school, I would have said, probably not messy church, not sure it works in Oxford, might do. But I'd say, what I do know as the husband of a teacher and being on the school governor is that parents in Oxford are obsessed with their kids' school performance and how they can help them with their homework. So why don't we do a pyjama party? And why don't we do it on Friday? But it could be Thursday. And the kids come in their pyjamas and the parents come. And first of all, the kids do their homework. And the parents are there and there's a teacher there who gives the parents ideas for how they can support their children with their homework. When the kids have done their homework, then everyone eats together, by which time dads can join in. That's a few games straight off to bed. That's what I would do as an experiment. So is it, you know, that's my idea. Is it a good idea? I have no idea. The only way to find out is to chat to people. So, you know, the first thing I do is to chat around. I chat to other parents, do this with work, who would come? Would you come? Well, oh, quite a few people are, are being just polite. Pol politeness is not <coughs> enough. I need enthusiasm. This is not going to work. All right? Or I get this massively enthusiastic response. Brilliant. So let's try it. So we try it and then we tweak it or we stop it. So um, you just need to experiment like mad. Follow the fresh expressions journey, the serving first journey. This is great if you're coaching people you're coaching, you know, there's these two or three Christians in your congregation or this member of your congregation has brought a friend and you've taken them through all this. Um, this follow the fresh expression journey is a, is a brilliant, or serving first journey, is, is a brilliant way of just measuring where you've got to. You know, what stage are you at? We're still at the listening stage. No, we started doing some loving and serving and we, and we did our experiments and it's begun to work. Yes, community is being formed. Are we being very intentional about forming community? Could we put in place anything that would encourage community to have greater depth? You know, this, this little journey might prompt that. And then, wow, where have we got to? What about exploring discipleship? How do we draw some paths from where we've got to, to exploring discipleship? Well, we'll talk about that tomorrow. But this uh, journey gives you both language and some concepts to see where you've got to. Uh, on, 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 on the journey you're trying to make. 
and then follow the follow the journey and then finally obviously you know this is ridiculous if God is not involved you know, why why are we doing this so so all this underpinned by prayer so um, if you're a church leader and you're wanting to uh, encourage this uh, then I'd be saying um, just give permission to members of your congregation give them support perhaps by coaching them through these sorts of questions you throw all the things I've said there into questions and it becomes a, a checklist for you and give away control but keep light touch accountability all right give away control but keep light touch accountability and the best accountability is for you to be meeting regularly with these two or three people the core team uh, as they begin to explore what they're going to do so let me uh, uh, stop that and again just give you a couple of minutes two minutes in in your in your buzz groups just to respond to what i'm saying you know what's exciting you what's challenged you what might you think differently and then we'll have 20 minutes to save questions Yeah, 
Okay, shall we come back together as a, as a whole group? Try that again. Shall we come back together as a, as a whole group now? Okay. <laughs> um, and um, we'll use this last 20 minutes or so. So you do um, so just a, a, an opportunity again either to comment on what I've just said or ask questions about it or about the earlier stuff or, or anything that's relevant yeah um, can you share any experiences where the experience of Russians, Russians has actually transformed the local congregation and their culture um, yes so um, in St George's Deal, they, which is on the southeast of, of England, uh, they went about uh, completely transforming, turning themselves inside out. So they now, I think, have 15 what they would call missional communities, which is just another word for fresh expressions. Uh, they say one of the impacts is, is that it's released 60 lay people into leadership who were not leading before. Uh, they would say the numbers involved uh, have grown dramatically, but they can't put figures to it. I can go to another church where I can put some figures. And um, they, this was a church uh, in Shropshire, uh, where they have now seven or eight fresh expressions, ranging from this medical cafe I was talking about, to a messy church with 120 people, to a walking missional community, and so on. And uh, they did a head count about four or five years ago. Um, they found that there were 170 people in the congregation and they were in touch with, through the month, about 250 people in the local community. They did a head count uh, about a year ago and they found they were in touch with something like 500 to 540 people in the community through the month. These were people coming to their fresh expressions uh, some, at some point. And um, in terms of regular attendance at the main meetings, of the fresh expressions plus the congregation, the total number was 340 or something. So, I mean, not all the people coming to the main meetings are Christians or anything like that, but this shows you a, a very significant transformation. Now, in both cases, the people who led the change, the ministers who led the change, were superb change agents. Uh, and, and, they, and they did it brilliantly, and they have the interpersonal and the other skills to do that. Um, so that, but not all of us can do it, which is why I'm saying there's an alternative route, which you just start bottom up. But if you go to the top down, it can be, and is increasingly being demonstrated to be really transformational for congregation. And the thing about these missional communities, fresh expressions, is uh, you know if you're a small church, um, you know you might not think in terms of 15 missional communities. You might have a congregation of 40 people. You might think of one or two. But even one or two will be radically, you know, transformation. We'll take your total numbers up to 80 to 100. So, um, so as a, as a source of growth, they they have to be at the moment the best source of church growth that we know. But I want to say that is not the main reason for doing them. The main reason for starting a fresh expression is because they embody so much of the kingdom. You know, they love and serve people. They create community and they share the gospel in that context. So they embody the kingdom. They are a brilliant way of serving people. So I think if we see fresh expressions as simply starting to build up the church, then for me it takes away all the enthusiasm. I think that is really boring. But if we see them as something that can really love and serve people in a very rich and fruitful way, that generates energy, uh, certainly for me, and I get excited. Yeah. I put in this journey, which you've uh, set out for us, is there a training interface somewhere? So let's take Louise, if she's, uh, they're all watching human videos, and then she decides, we need something deeper here, she does the other group. So is she trained, or does she, yeah. do you get support from the church on 
on yeah. you know, what she does yeah. next, or is she still floundering? You know, how <laughs> uh, no, there's a really great question and one that we're grappling with. Um, among the lay people, um, uh, and indeed among some ordinary, but if you take the clergy out of it, among the lay leaders of Fresh Expressions, the great majority have no training and no recognition. And um, the Methodist Church uh, in the UK, uh, which has experimented with, with uh, uh, 12 or so Fresh Expressions, which they invested a lot of money into, now they're rolling out pathways for uh, lay and ordained people who want to start Fresh Expressions. And they're offering, you know, uh, you join this pathway and you get four types of support. Uh, one is that you get the opportunity to join um, a learning community with other people, with pioneering. Uh, you also have the opportunity to be coached uh, in what you're doing. Uh, you also keep a, 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 a journal where you reflect on your practice. But the fourth element is what they call a tutor. And the tutor you meet with once a year to discuss formal, accessing formal bits of learning. And these formal bits of learning would be just-in-time learning, it might be a, a short course, you might decide to do a diploma, whatever you feel, because there's a recognition that these folks do need, and many of them want, um, more formal types of learning and training. So many of these folks would, would, would you know, fly by the seat of their pants, but they will learn a lot through coaching. And it, often the coaching is informal. So we're starting an all-age fresh expression. Oh my goodness me, what about child protection? So I'll go and talk to someone who knows about child protection. You know, we're, we're doing cafe church. Oh my goodness, health and safety. So they'll find out someone who's an expert in health and safety. And it will be coached for an hour and whatever so that they know what they have to do to satisfy regulations. So there's a lot of informal coaching going, a lot of informal learning as you'd expect going on. And that's great. You, one doesn't want to kill it, but one wants to perhaps make it easier for people to access that sort of information. So we're talking about you know, creating some sort of online resource where you know, people with skills can be listed and people who want to access those skills can go to them and access them. You know, something we're talking about. Yeah. Well, um, for me, one of the questions is when this no longer is fresh, yeah. uh, when the people have uh, explored this for a couple of years and now want to change, um, have you some uh, words of wisdom about uh, how you celebrate what was and say, uh, let's go and try something, something else or yeah. something else evolve out of it rather than keeping on yeah. uh, insisting that that group keep yeah. I, I think this is a journey that we still need to make, actually. Um, uh, there's still quite a lot of talk in the institutions and in the fresh expression circles about creating sustainable fresh expressions. Um, I'm not sure that's the right language. Uh, I think what we want to see are fruitful fresh expressions. And um, fruitfulness does not equate with longevity. Um, you know, if we think of the Jerusalem church in the first century, in terms of church history, it was very short-lived, uh, but it was amazingly fruitful. So um, we want fresh expressions that are going to be very, very fruitful. And, um, and that means that some of them may only live, have a, a life that's of limited duration. So the most important thing, once we've got that in our minds, uh, I think there are two things I would want to say. The first thing is that if a fresh expression could only exist for a short period, then as those come, people come to faith, they do need to be connected to the wider church. So that there's some chance that they'll find their home in the wider church if the fresh expression no longer meets their, no longer meets at all, or may no longer meet their spiritual needs because they've grown, at a, uh, grown out, if you like, of a fresh expression, just like people grow out of local congregations. So I think that's really, you know, hugely important. Um, but also, I, I, I think the idea of multiplying your fresh expression is very important. So someone I was talking to in Melbourne, for example, they started with a small group of Christians. They grew a missional community. They now have grown from that seven other missional communities. So they've got seven or eight missional communities altogether, all starting from this one seed, if you like. So the um, um, you know so that 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 gives continued dynamism and, and 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 potential for growth. So as people come to faith, one might be encouraging them to, well, you know, can you do the sort of thing we did? 
you know, is there a group of people, you know, in your walk of your life that you could serve? Can you find another Christian and serve them? Um, so Sorted, for example, which is one of our more fruitful uh, fresh expressions among teenagers, it started among 11 to 14 year olds. These are now 18, 19 to 20 year olds. They don't go to college and leave home where they are, they stay put. So those people came to the leader and said, can we do for the 11 to 14s what you did with us when we were 11 to 14? So that gives it a whole new lease of life, if you like, and injects new energy into this. So often I say to pioneers, especially people who are full time, I say, for goodness sake, do not think that you are called to start a fresh expression. If we're paying you just to start one fresh expression, that strikes me as an awful waste of money. You are being paid to start a network of fresh expressions. So think of it like that. It's a waste of money because people start fresh expressions in their spare time. So why should we be paying them to do it in the full time? You know, most of these things have been started by people in their spare time. But I get excited by paying people if they're going to start a network of fresh expressions. But if they're going to just do in their full time what people do in their spare time, then I can't see what the point is. So be blunt. Um, so anyway, yeah. yeah. <coughs> Comments on that. Yeah. I'm just looking at the profile, as you mentioned before, that the person who's going to be good at this stuff um, has to have some kind of low tolerance for control, uh, tolerance for low control. Yep. And uh, <coughs> high appetite for play, as well as a capacity to not. I've heard it described as this, there's two types of people. There's people who have one big idea, like an elephant, it takes nine months to birth the thing. Yep. And then there's others who are like turtles. They'll have thousands of these turtles and then leave them to the wild and two of them survive and the other 99 get yep. in. Mm -hmm. But that, that kind of like that, as you were talking about, low control, high appreciation of failure or the capacity to learn from Compared, failure and yeah. feedback. And lots of good ideas. Yeah. Is that, am I getting that right? No, that's not bad. I think that's really great. Um, but I'd qualify it by saying that needs to be in the team. The team need to have, have the, the, that capacity. Yeah. So um, it may be that the team leader has never had a good idea in his life or her life. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? But if, there, if there's someone else on the team who's great with ideas, then, then she's brilliant. And you rely on her. The team as a whole have to have this a willingness for low control yeah. um, and then do need a, a, a willingness um, to learn from feedback yeah. and to try and try. Yeah. Um, so uh, and I think that's fine. Yeah, uh, the, the, the entrepreneurship research has found it very difficult to identify traits yeah. that equate with successful entrepreneurs. The only one that seems to stand out is self-efficacy, you know, the, the, the sense that you can do it. Um, but even that, I don't think, has to be in the leader. The leader might be rather timid in terms of, I mm, don't know, but quite good at convening people. Yeah. And it may be that the two other people she convenes are the ones that right. convince her, let's go and give it a go and it can work. So, uh, so again, well, you know, um, for the institution, oh, don't have too many generalizations here, you know, just go with the flow of whoever turns up and see what happens. Yeah. I, I guess that I sit in a, a, a congregational parish as a, as a minister there and part of the ongoing concern for my congregational parish, and which I'm sure is uh, fairly common to most, is of course the financial viability of that space. You know, how do we keep the lights on? How do we pay the ministry person? How do we do all those things? How do, what, what's been your experience in how do we convince the people who are most concerned about those things and we will have them, how do we convince them they're going into this space which is not going to look like bringing huge monetary returns, is, is going to be a valuable use of our very precious resources that we're, we're kind of trying to hold on to a bit, you know, in those spaces. How do we, how do, we, how do we sell this so it doesn't, yep. in, in the, for those people who have been very faithful and they, yep. you know, they, they, they've done all the things because of their faithfulness? Right. Well, I, I think, that, that, that I think um, it's carrots and sticks. 
So the stick is, if you go on as you are, you're going to have nothing left. Okay, so they, they knew that. You know, they've just got to look at their age structure. Uh, and they'll always come up with one or two exceptions. But basically, you know, when they, that generation goes, there's nothing left. So the question for them is, do you want to be the one generation in this church that never left anything worthwhile behind? That's the question for them. Um, the, that, the, the carrot is that some of our fresh expressions have made financial contributions. So there was one in Hull where it came out of an alpha course and they, the group stayed together and effectively formed a congregation. And the parent congregation were quite sad because they didn't see them very often. But after a few years, the leader of that little alpha congregation came to the church treasurer and said, can we help you with your church expenses? And that's sort of music to a church treasurer's ears. <laughs> so, um, um, you know, so, so I'm not saying there are lots of examples like that, but there are some. So I'll be saying to folks, do not prejudge the Holy Spirit here. You know, do not prejudge that the... That do not assume that the Holy Spirit will not teach these people how to give. Why should that? Why? Why? Why should that be? Why? 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 Why should the Holy Spirit suddenly decide He'll teach you how to give, but not them? You know. So let's just wait and see, because if they're growing into discipleship uh, and becoming more mature, then in time, the question of finance will occur, and it may be earlier than you think, because most people outside the church fully understand that you pay for clubs. You know, they, in the Church of England, the only people who don't understand that you pay for clubs are people in the Church of England. You know, <laughs> well, well, what's going on here? You know, so um, you know, so you know, um, you know, if you're if you're willing to be quite explicit about it and teach it, you know, it, 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 it's okay. It'll work. You know, so there's something there about being willing to teach this stuff. One more question before we. I mean, tomorrow we're going to look a little bit more at. The discipleship, we may be joined by one to others and we'll look at a bit more discipleship, but just anything else for tonight? Time to wrap up, do you think? Time to wrap up? Do you want to wrap up for us? Yeah. Thank you, Michael. Um, thanks, thank you. I, I, I've got a page of, um, I hope I'm going to be able to read this tomorrow. Um, <laughs> I started off on too small a piece of paper, I think. <laughs> but a couple of things that, that, that really uh, stuck out for me. I mean, some, some, I mean, would say it's obvious, but I keep having to be reminded um, of some of these things. It all starts with listening, um, was one of the things that, that we mentioned really early on. I was really interested um, by that sense that pioneer ministers wasn't and isn't the answer, that, that fresh expressions of pioneering happens anyway. Um, and it's not about us setting up a whole other kind of ecosystem of pioneering ministers, um, but actually that, that role that we know so well of pastoring and caring and nurturing and supporting and being alongside is really, really important. And that's, I, I mean, that's something that I really want to think about. Um, I'm really intrigued by this question of what does leadership look like if leadership is sharing a gift? Um, that was a, another statement from fairly early on, so I want to think a little bit about that. Um, and innovation by iteration, those weren't your words, but that, just that sense of little bit by little bit by little bit by little bit. Um, that, that quite often innovation doesn't come with the huge leap, it comes with the little bit by little bit. Uh, and everything like that. So I, I've been really, uh, like I said, I've got a whole bunch of things that I want to try and think about. Um, so I, I certainly appreciate uh, that. Um, folks, thanks for being here tonight. I think we'll see uh, quite a few of you tomorrow.